We come now thanking you for yet another opportunity to share your word. As always, we're leaning totally upon you to open up our understanding. Let us receptive to your voice. As I decrease, you increase. As I sit down, you stand up. I be behind the cross that your people might see you. Let your word go forth with power that the lost may be found. Let it go forth with conviction that the wayward would be restored. Let it go forth with comfort that spirits might be healed. And Father, we'll be so careful to give your name all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We give honor to God today who is the head of our lives. We give honor to our board of deacons this morning. We acknowledge our mothers, Zion. We give honor to our first lady today. And to all of you, my father's children. Amen. That's my prayer. I want to be wherever the Lord is. I don't want to be anywhere outside of His will. Amen. Amen. There are two passages of Scripture I want to call your attention to. Uh, the first being Psalm number 89, verses 13 and 14. And put your finger there and go with me to 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Verses 13 and 14. Again, that is Psalm number 89, verse number 13 and 14, and then go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 13 and 14. Will you have it if you were standing in honor of God's word? Psalm. Number 89, verse number 13, we find these words. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 13 says, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. You may be seated in the presence of God. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, the hearers, and the doers of his word. Amen. That verse number 14 says, But by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance may also be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. And for a few moments, I want to share from the subject, justice, not just us. Justice, not just us. The story is told of how in 2006, journalist and writer Mike Nichol of Cape Town, South Africa wrote with the I Have a Dream speech, Martin Luther King realized the hopes of 250,000 gathered at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And in addition across the country, millions more watched a live television broadcast. The moral force of black America's demand for equality was undeniable. Well, and I want to say the moral face for justice and equality has always been 
undeniable. Now, I'm not trying to be funny, but the force has always been with us. Right. Oh, yes, from the great disputes in Independence Hall over wording in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. Uh, even down to the war against slavery spurned by the religious right that led to the Silver War. As a matter of fact, from the foundation of the world, God's moral force of his universe has always been on our side. And when I stop and just um, think about it, the Lord has always been with us as a people. From the very beginning, we've had to struggle to make it to where we are. And you know, the trouble is that in mankind, morality is interpreted. In other words, what I mean by this is despite God's establishment of justice and judgment, as a habitation of his throne and solely within his authority, there are still those who, as Romans 10 and 33 say, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are going about establishing their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. In other words, we got the word of God, it's preached, it's taught, folk come up in the church, and they still don't understand. You got folk that will put a mask on, and in the name of Jesus, they still hate no black folk. We got other folk who will call on the name of God, and they will just as quick as ram an airplane into a building. We have folk, no matter what the word of God is saying, they have a reprobate mind, and they want to do things their way. Amen. Just as any quality are guiding principles for all Christians. Acts 2 and 44 laid it out. It laid out the mandate to the early church uh, to have all things in common so that no one would have to live without their basic human needs being met. In other words, sharing is how the early church expressed their mutual concern for each other in the body of Christ. They remembered that when God gave the Israelite food in the wilderness, he gave according to their needs. Everyone always had enough. And what's so special about the early church is that early Christians were taught that they must have to, they, they must do no less. In other words, whatever the Lord laid out as the mandate, the early church got it. But nowadays, the, the, the church of the 21st century don't understand. We still have to preach liberation. We still have to teach right from wrong. And we still have to live and walk upright before the Lord. The Apostle Paul shouldn't have had to remind the Corinthians of this truth of God's universe, but he had to do it. And if we're truthful, we are still reminding mankind today that equality has proven to be a tough pill to swallow, especially in America. Why? Because our capitalist society teaches what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. In other words, keep your hands off of my stuff. Everybody is only concerned about themselves. We only care about what we have. And God bless the one that don't have it. But let me tell you something. We got to change our mindset because it's not God's will that any should perish. And so the capitalist attitude is the reason why the minimum wage has become stagnant. It, the, the, the capitalist attitude is the reason why inflation has continued to chip away at our annual income. Capitalism in its purest form is the direct opposite of what God teaches us. You see, in God's world, every master has an obligation to care for his servants in just fashion. Oh yeah, and servants or those who require to work for another pay off a debt. They earned their fair wage until the debts were paid off and they were free to establish their own household. In other words, no man and no woman was chained to a lifetime of servitude. And even in after the 50th year, all of the family debt was forgiven. But I dare you to, to, to go to families who are suffering from a systematic poverty. Those who have worked two and three minimum wage jobs for generation after generation and still can't push their family income above the poverty line. I mean, imagine if 
may die on war. If Wendy's or Burger King or Walmart uh, had to guarantee every employee a way out of poverty within a reasonable time period, can you imagine if, if the job's focus was to establish that everybody was on equal ground? And let me say this, equality is not communistic. It's simply the idea that each of us is our brother's keeper. In other words, we got to be concerned. When we see a need, we ought not, let me tell you something, when we see folk and they're going through, uh, and you know, the last thing we ought to say, but the first thing we ought to do is pray for them. But the last thing you ought to say is, I'll pray for you. Why? Because if they have a need right now, don't you know you got to meet the need in order for them to hear you? When the good Samaritan helped the man who had been beaten up and left for dead, he didn't. Uh, he did so out of compassion for his needs. In other words, he saw that the person had been beat up, and he saw the need, and he met the immediate need. The good Samaritan did not give the man half of what he owned, but he did agree to provide whatever was necessary for the man's full and complete recovery. And why did he do it? Because the Bible says to whom much is given, ah, much is required. In other words, the more you get from God, the more you ought to be giving to God. The more God blesses you, the more you ought to bless others with whatever you have. The idea of capitalism or free enterprise, however noble at its root, is dishonored by those at the upper end of the economic spectrum with their tight control over the disbursement of profits. In short, wages are stagnant because it is in their best interest to keep them stagnant. Oh yes, and without government intervention, they will remain stagnant. Statistics support with glaring proof that the rich are getting richer while the poor are getting poorer. In an uncontrolled capitalistic society, Big business thirst for cheap labor to maximize its profit index. And it's no wonder why the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And I always tell people, people want to say that, that money is the root of all evil. No, 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 no. Money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. And so we wish inequality related only to desperate income. The truth of the matter is, most of us could deal with the inequality if it only meant that we had to work harder to achieve our goals. But sadly, inequality shows its ugly face in many other ways. In other words, we're not just any unequal when it comes to income, but we're unequal in other areas of life. And so it is much as this is Black History Month, I want to deal with the areas where there is no justice, but it's just us. First of all, first of all, there is inequality in opportunity. Uh, opportunity, opportunity in what? I'm glad you had. It's inequality in the opportunity in housing, in income, in business loans, and in mortgages. And we can keep on going down the line, uh, but I don't want to bore you with the statistics. But just look at who lives in subsidizing housing. Right. Look at who works at the minimum wage job. Look at who cannot get a loan to start a business. And look at who can't get a mortgage to buy a home. And I tell you right now, there's no justice. It's just us. Help me somebody. But not only is there inequality of opportunity, but there's also inequality when it comes to justice. Ah, justice in what? I'm glad you asked. With the harassment and the profiling and the unfair sentencing. Now that's a big uh, We got a whole lot of us. Let me tell you something. If they can't get you in the job place, all they got to do is get handcuffs on you and they'll, they'll eventually extinguish you. But let me tell you something. Uh, we need to start fighting for equality in the justice system. Just as hard as the media has worked to shed a glaring light on the long-standing problem of profiling and brute force and brutal force toward African-American black men 
and women are continue to die at the hand of angry police driven by their own hatred. Oh yes, those who don't die are too often sentenced to an unfair incarceration term that penalizes well beyond the offense. In other words, folk are committing the crime, but the time that they're serving is not equal with what they have done. Folk are still doing wrong, but let me tell you something, it's not just happening here on the east side, but I dare you to travel to the west side. It's not just happening on the west side, but I dare you to go out into the suburbs. There's all kind of stuff going on, but for some reason, there's no justice, it's just us. It's just us. Even with the recent election of a new president, who began this month, Black History Month. He began the month by holding a press conference with a panel of African Americans who included his former rival, Ben Carson. His first African American star of his reality show, Omarosa. Then there's a preacher who's from Cleveland Heights, not Cleveland. And that wouldn't be so sad 
If it wasn't for the fact that they're not bused by the school system, many of them are catching RTA buses to make it. They're the condition of many of our kids that they're forced to endure. I've talked to some teachers, and we got many families who struggle with being able to pay fees for books and supplies. We got many families who struggle to be able to provide clothing and lunches for their child. Yeah. Yet, if you go to suburbia, America, I wish I had a church who understands that when it comes to equality in the education system, there's no justice. It's just us. And I believe all of this is happening to just us because of my last point. Not only is there inequality in opportunity, not only is there inequality in the justice system, not only is there inequality in the education system, but how many of you know there's inequality in citizenship? Yes. That's a big one. That's a big one. In citizenship, with the inconsistency of voter registration, with the rules and the regulations. You know, it amazes me that in this 21st century, it's hard to fathom that we are still battling unjust voter registration requirements. I, I, I'm telling you, I just believe if Dr. King were here today, he would be appalled that we're still having the same battle of getting folk to be able to register to vote and have their voices heard. All this inequality stands in stark contrast to what Paul is teaching here in the text in 2 Corinthians when he said, For I mean not that other men be eased and be hurt, but by equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Dr. King once said, The self cannot be self without ourselves. Ah, I'm going to say that again. The self cannot be self without ourselves. John Dome, an English clergyman from 15th century, he put it this way. He said, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the man. And we are all connected and whether we like it or not, our survival is unavoidably linked to our fellow man. Yeah. Dr. King said it like this. He said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, it affects all of us indirectly. Yeah. And so I want to encourage you this morning. If we're going to be a nation of justice and equality, we must learn to treat others as equals. Oh yes, we need to examine ourselves and put on the garment of kindness. You know, we can be so mean and stand off at time. But how do you know a kind word will go a long way? We need to examine ourselves and put on the garment of equality. Let me tell you, we were all created equal, and you're no better than me, and I'm no better than you. We need to examine ourselves and put on the garment of justice. During his lifetime, Dr. Martin Luther King was blatantly classified by his white counterparts as being an extremist. And at first it bothered him. No peaceful man wants to wear the title of being an extremist. But gradually, Dr. King came to accept and even prefer the title of being an extremist. He responded and said, wasn't Abraham Lincoln an extremist? Lincoln, listen, he said, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. That sounds extreme to me. Uh, uh, Dr. King said, wasn't Thomas Jefferson an extremist? Jefferson said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that not just white men, not just the red man, not just black men, but all men were created equal. That was extreme. Uh, the question that Dr. King said, 
is not whether we be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists who would prefer and preserve injustice, or who would be an extremist who will cause justice? And so as I get ready to close this morning, I want the church to know that God is an extremist whose magnificent rule and super rule demands in the book of Psalms in the 89th chapter he said justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. And I can only imagine the face of God and I can imagine the face of Dr. King that they will make when they see what man calls justice and equality. Oh yes, it is an expression of justice and equality when unarmed men, black men, are shot in the back or choked to death or executed with their hands up. I can imagine what God's face will look like or Dr. King's face will look like and what we call justice and equality. It's an expression of justice and equality when poor children are sent to inferior schools and taught from outdated books and an obsolete curriculum. Oh yes, it's an expression of justice and equality when a state forces a poor city to drink from a waterhead that they know is filled with pollution. Hallelujah, it's an expression of justice and equality when a Dakota Sioux burial site is less sacred than a white-owned farmland. How many of you know that man must learn to apply God's justice? And when you apply God's justice, you got to do it with love. Justice applied without love is nothing more than misused power. In other words, when you hand down justice, if you're not doing it in love, you are abusing your authority. Hallelujah. Justice and equality deny our dangerous habits. Why? Because they breed a deep-seated sorrow propelled by long-lasting trials. And discontent leads to despair. The kind that causes men to rise up in anger. And so as we see what's happening in our country, we want to teach the right thing to do. We want to teach the right things to say. But my question is how long did the white man think black men were going to continue to suffer at their hand before they rose up in retaliation? But I bring you some good news this morning. We don't have to go tit for tat. We don't have to go fist for fist. We don't have to go gun for gun. Because there's a bomb in Gilead. There's a bomb that's there to encourage those who are in despair. There's a bomb that's there to strengthen those who are weak. There's a bomb that's there to guide those who are in peril. There's a bomb that's there to assure those in torment. There's a bomb that's there to comfort those in sorrow. Oh yes, there's a bomb in Gilead. A bomb to inspire those facing confrontation. Oh yes, and I want you to be encouraged because the time will come when judgment will roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream as Amos 5 and 24 says. But until that day, I want you to know that we're called to bear our burdens in the heat of the day. The Bible says in Matthew, the fifth chapter 39, whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, you got to turn to him the other also. Oh, yes, why? Because I know somebody who gives us the strength to carry the cruelest of crosses. I know somebody who gives us the strength to bear the heaviest burden. I know somebody who's able to give us the strength to endure the saddest sorrow. I know somebody who's able to give us strength to face the greatest danger. And his name is Jesus Hallelujah. And when justice and equality are denied, how do you know that Jesus gives us strength? Strength to survive the darkest night. Strength to undergo the longest trial. He gives us strength to defeat the most stubborn doubt. He gives us strength to climb the tallest mountain. I don't know about you, but when I think about Jesus and the love he extended toward us, out of the hill of Calvary. Hallelujah, when he was nailed in his hands and nailed in his feet. 